Good morning, saints, or whatever it is. It's good to see you here today. I'm glad to be worshiping together with you and with you online. Uh, whenever you are tuning in, uh, it's good to be together and to, to worship the Lord in this way. Um, I have just one quick announcement. We have our annual congregational meeting coming up, which we're doing twice because we have to do everything twice now. Um, but next, well, this coming Sunday, if you're watching online, you've already missed that one. But on Sunday, uh, 9 o'clock, we're, we're having the um, regular Jubilee service, followed by annual congregational meeting. And then um, next Wednesday, we will also have that. So it's just a, a presentation of our annual report and doing the once a year business that we need to do as a congregation. Uh, hopefully you can attend on, well, let me, you need to attend on Sunday. Unless you really like the sermon. I don't know if I like it that much. So. Um, why don't you just come back Wednesday? Sound good? All right, any other announcements or prayer concerns? Let's take a moment and prepare our hearts for worship. Brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. We know that mourning and rejoicing, having little or having plenty, are all temporary conditions. The present form of this world is passing away. The majesty and righteousness of the Lord endures forever.
we come together and lift our hearts to you. We lift our voices to you. We lift our spirits to you. And God, we desire to meet you here. We desire to know you and be known by you. God, this is the place, this is the time that you have set aside for us. Help us to enter into it fully, wholeheartedly. Help us to focus our minds on you, to focus our thoughts on you, to focus our very selves on you, that we might know you and draw closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, as we come together before God, let's lay aside those things that might be stumbling blocks for us, those things that might get in the way. Let's join together in our prayer of confession. You are the rock of our salvation, O God. When our souls thirst for righteousness, they are satisfied in you. We lift our hearts and hands in the sanctuary. With our lips, we praise you. Yet we must admit, Lord, that we lack commitment. Christ preaches repentance. We keep going our own way. He declares new blessings. We dwell on the past. He makes sacrifices on our behalf. We hold tightly to our material treasures. We say we want to follow you, but our deeds betray us. By your grace, renew us and cleanse us of sin. somewhere out there in the future. You don't have to keep on waiting today. God has made you new. God has forgiven you. God has given you the chance to begin again. Thanks be to God. The peace of Christ be with you. Now share that peace with one another. Let's come back together now and affirm our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us turn now to the reading of God's Word. As we will prepare to listen to the scripture, please join me in the prayer for illumination. You speak to us in many ways, O God. Help us to hear you in every opportunity, and especially in your revealed Word, as we turn to it now. May we grow in knowledge and faith as we attend to your voice. 
Our first scripture reading is Psalm 62, 5 through 12. For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor, my mighty rock. My refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion in the balances they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God and steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord for you repay all according to their work. This is the word of God. second scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. I invite you to listen now for God's word. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. 
and immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Shonda's trying to get her, uh, her, her, her stand counter on her watch. Well, they say that timing is everything. Two women were driving down the highway when their car got a flat tire, so they pulled over to the shoulder, and uh, since neither of them knew how to change a tire, they called AAA. And while they were there waiting, a red pickup truck pulled up behind them, and they looked back and they saw a man and a woman in the truck, and the man got out and offered to help. The woman explained that uh, they had a flat tire. He said, oh, I can help you. I can, I can change that out for you, no problem. And so he quickly did so, and he got himself good and dirty in the process as he was wiping off his hands and, 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 uh, and cleaning himself up a little bit. The women were thanking him profusely. They were just so appreciative. And the man just smiled at them and said, well, I guess God had me in the right place at the right time. Then he got back in his truck with his wife and pulled out onto the highway. And uh, the, the women pulled out behind them, and they were following them for about a mile, when all of a sudden his truck pulled over very suddenly. And the women pulled over behind him, figuring he must have forgotten something. When they got out, the man's wife was already out of the car and was just waving her arms wildly, trying to uh, get anyone's attention. What's wrong, they said. It's my husband, cried the wife. I think he's having a heart attack. Well, here's where it gets good. The driver of that first car with a flat tire was a nurse. And she performed CPR on the man until the paramedics arrived. And because she was there, he survived and made it to the hospital and he was just fine. God had put both of them in the right place at the right time. Timing is everything, or something very close to it at least. The gospel lesson from Mark today provides one more example of timing tells the story of Jesus calling his first four disciples, the fishermen, Simon, Andrew, Andrew, James, and John. And now there's no real setup or preamble in this story. It just, it just begins. Uh, the story reads as if Jesus appears in Galilee one day and, and just kind of zaps these fishermen with his magic disciple-making wand, and off they go. Of course, in reality, Jesus would have been living and, and working in that area for a long time before this moment came. He would very likely have spent significant time preaching in the region of Galilee before he ever spoke to these four men. They would have been familiar with him by reputation, at least, if not through personal contact. Jesus and his message would have been known quantities to them when he called, when he made that invitation. So one thing we see happening here is that Jesus makes an invitation to discipleship deliberately and with forethought. It was exactly the right time for him to make this pitch to the four young men. And when Jesus spoke to them, they were ready. Immediately, they left their nets and they followed him. Other times that I've preached this passage, I've focused on that, that following, the, the sacrifice. What did they have to give up to follow Jesus? But today I want to focus on the timing. I wonder what it was that had prepared them for this moment to answer his call. How had God's spirit been working in their lives? 
Years ago, one of the church growth gurus, John Maxwell, wrote a book, The 21 Essential Laws of, of Leadership, which has become a go-to text for a lot of pastors. And in this book, one of the laws that John taught was the law of timing, which he described through the following four truths. He said, you can have the, the wrong action at the wrong time, which will produce disaster. You can have the right action at the wrong time, which will produce resistance and rebellion. You can have the wrong action at the right time, which is a mistake and leads to failure. Or you can have the right action at the right time. And that's what you need if you want success and if you want growth, the right action at the right time. Now I was thinking, what would have made Jesus call to these disciples the wrong action? Well, of course, he could have picked the wrong people or given them the wrong mission. What if Jesus had sought out the Herodians or the Pharisees or the Sadducees or anyone else who might have made more worldly sense to be his followers than a couple of no-account fishermen? You know, what if he had tried to move God's mission through the religious and political power structures of his day? That would have made sense in a way. Or what if he hadn't taught these young men to fish for people? That is, to pass on what they learned and make more disciples. What if instead he had let them believe that they were special? They were unique recipients of God's favor because they were just so gosh darn great. And Jesus just wanted to have a special relationship with them in particular. Any of these outcomes would have been a disaster for the spread of the gospel. But what if his timing had been wrong? What if Jesus had come to the fishermen too early? when his own calling and purpose hadn't yet been established, before his baptism by John, before his temptation in the wilderness, before anyone had any idea what he stood for. I imagine those young fishermen wouldn't have given him the time of day. Or what if he'd waited too long and come to the lake shore after these young men were a few years older and perhaps were married with young children were in charge of the family business, were weighed down with responsibilities that they couldn't abandon. What if he had simply shown up on the wrong day, when they weren't all feeling that precise mix of, of curiosity and confidence and dissatisfaction with the status quo that was necessary for them to be able to answer yes at that moment when he asked them? I think Jesus was very conscious of timing. One preacher I heard said he lived his life with an acute awareness of God's timing. His actions always lined up with God's plans and intentions, and there was nothing that Jesus did that wasn't considered in light of his mission of salvation. So Jesus always had the right action at the right time to move that mission forward. You might say Jesus had divine timing. Jesus called who he called, when he called them, entirely on purpose. He knew what he was doing, he knew where he was going, and in his divine timing, he knew what had to happen and when in order to bring the right people along with him for the ride. Now, as we inherit that mission from the fishermen and women who have fished us into this boat, I want to tell you that timing is as important as it's ever been. I've been thinking about this a lot in the current pandemic domin den dominated world where we now live. In so many ways, this virus has, has kind of just punched a big pause button on all of our lives. We've gotten used to postponing trips and sports and performances and weddings and funerals and everything else. You know, I've seen businesses with a sign in the window, we'll be back when it's over. Schools and churches that have to lock down for 14 days at a time whenever an exposure happens. Even my daughter has told me more than once about her big plans for when the coronavirus goes away. I think for most of these things, our attitude is, well, it'll go back to normal eventually. 
We'll just kind of wait it out until the danger is passed. Now is not the time for us to worry about X or Y. And in many cases, that's probably the right approach. You know, I believe that we all need to do our part to keep our communities safe, and staying home is one of the best ways that we can do that. I can't help but wonder, though, how often we might have let that become an excuse not to do the good that we could do. You know, salvation and reconciliation of all humankind doesn't seem like work that should go on pause. How often are we missing or ignoring opportunities to answer Jesus' call by assuming that now is just not the time? I saw this story uh, on the internet recently that was a, a mother who had um, gotten a call from school that her high school age son was not feeling well, she needed to come pick him up. And, and so she did, and, and when she got him in the car, it kind of turned out he wasn't really sick, he wasn't ill in any way, he was just having a bad day, he was just in a funk. You ever have one of those days? And he just needed to get out of there, he needed to go home, do something else. Well, while they were driving home, they drove past a woman, who, a homeless woman, who was pushing her cart, and the boy really sat up and took notice. And he said, Mom, can we, can we stop up here? And when they stopped at the, uh, at the you know, little mall where he pointed out, he jumped out real quick and ran into a Payless shoes. And he came out a couple minutes later with two pairs of shoes, one that looked really comfortable and one that looked really sturdy. And he said, Mom, can we go back and find that woman and give her these shoes? He had bought them with his own money. It was just an idea that had occurred to him. And so he went back and, and they found the woman. He said, here, I thought maybe you could use these. And the woman just broke down crying. It turned out it was her birthday. And this was the only birthday present that she'd gotten. Divine timing, isn't it? You know, just because our church life, our church attendance is on pause, doesn't mean our spiritual life has to be. Just because our mission trips get postponed, doesn't mean that we also have to postpone caring for our neighbors. Just because we aren't connecting face to face with people, doesn't mean that we should waste hours on Facebook especially if we're mostly there to argue with strangers rather than connect with friends. The current time is not a great time for doing church and faith in the same ways that we always have, but it is still the right time to be making disciples. It's always the right time to be making disciples, and I'm just worried that we might be tempted more than ever to be focusing on ourselves in this time to the exclusion of anyone else. Paul Powell wrote in his book, The Complete Disciple, many churches today remind me of a laboring crew trying to gather in the harvest while they sit in the tool shed. They go to the tool shed every Sunday, they study bigger and better methods of agriculture, they sharpen their hose, they grease their tractors, and then they get up and go home. They come back that night, they study bigger and better methods of agriculture again, they sharpen their hose and grease their tractors, and then they go home again. They come back Wednesday night, they study bigger and better methods of agriculture, they sharpen their hose, they grease their tractors, and they get up and go home. And they do this week in and week out, year in and year out, and nobody ever goes out into the fields to gather the harvest. That was written pre-pandemic, but I'm worried the temptation could be even stronger now that everybody knows going out into the fields is bad for community positivity rates. Instead of coming up with a new plan to somehow go out and gather the harvest without putting everyone at risk, we might just decide to stay in the shed forever, tinkering with the machinery. Saints, I think the work of God calls for some different tools altogether right now. And I am exceedingly proud of St. Andrew for the ways that you have adapted and figured out how to keep answering Jesus' call in this time. I love how you've made the adjustment to online studies and meetings and fellowship groups, keeping community going with the tools that you have. I am so appreciative of the service committee, the hard work that they've done, and all those who have continued to make contributions to meet the needs of our neighbors. 
I see the blessing of the families and educators who are using the internet to keep discipling our young people right now. I'm amazed and, and thankful to Joy and the handbells and the choir at the incarnation service for the creativity and the dedication that they've had to providing meaningful worship, even in the midst of the limitations that we have to deal with. I guess what I'm saying is, don't stop. Don't stop. You know, it might seem, in light of everything else, like now is the right time to, to slack off, to ease back, and, and, and to just become more passively involved, if we stay involved in the church at all. But in reality, this time is an opportunity like we've never seen before. It has never been easier to invite someone to church. All you have to do is send them a link. It's never been easier to get involved in a Bible study. You don't even have to get out of your PJs. It's never been easier to lead your family in faith. Just set aside a half an hour to watch a video lesson and answer the questions together. It's never been easier to give to the church, to support its ministries. You can do it from whatever screen you are watching on right now. Friends, believe it or not, at this very moment, we are at the lake shore, and Jesus is calling out to us to follow him. Now would be the perfect time to get up and answer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Friends, it's time for us to offer to God our hearts, our minds, our time, our energy. It's time for us to offer to God whatever we have to, to God's use to build the kingdom here in this place. So in this time, let us turn to God in prayer, in reflection, and contemplation. Let us consider what we have to give to God. Let us turn to God in prayer now. God, we thank you for the opportunity to come together in worship tonight. We thank you for the way that your voice speaks to us. We don't hear it the same way as those first disciples, those fishermen might have heard it, but we do hear it nonetheless. We're grateful to hear your word through scripture, through your prophets, through teachers, through preachers, through those who have led us in faith. We're grateful to know you better through their example. And we ask that as we continue to, to listen, as we continue to, to work to grow in our faith, that you would show us the way. 
We know that you are always active. You are always seeking out people to work alongside you to build your kingdom. You are always reaching out and, and calling us into relationship with you. Help us to recognize where you are sending us. Help us to turn our attention away from ourselves, away from our patterns, away from the mundane things that might distract us, might cloud our vision, and help us to turn our attention more fully towards you. God, we want to be useful. We want to be people who are, are good partners. We want to be people who understand your vision and your mission who understand what you are trying to do as you bring redemption to this broken world so that we can join with you. God, help us to look for ways to use the time that we have. We may think that there is just too much time and, and nothing to do with it. We may face boredom. We may face a sense of, uh, of lack of purpose. Or we may feel like we are overwhelmed, always running behind, never able to catch up. God, help us, no matter what our situation, no matter what our, our orientation towards the time in our days, help us to be more purposeful in the ways that we seek to follow you. We pray for those on our prayer list today. We pray for those who are facing difficult situations, who are facing challenges and struggles, illness, loss, pain. We ask, God, that you would be with them and help us to find meaningful ways to help shoulder their burdens, to share in, in what they are facing so that they don't have to face it alone. We lift them to you now in speech and in silence and trust you to hear our prayers, God. God, thank you for hearing these prayers. We join our voices now in the prayer your son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever. Amen. Please rise for our closing hymn. Uh, this one is, Lord, you have come to the lake shore. I'm just curious how many people are familiar with this one. All right. You and me, Barb. So uh, Joy is going to play it all the way through so we get the tune and, uh, and then we'll do our best.
friends, we know that Jesus calls people. He calls fishermen. He calls tax collectors. He calls zealots. He calls failures. He calls losers. He calls dropouts. He calls kings and queens. He calls you and me. Because he needs us to join with him in this project of saving the world. He wants us to make disciples as we become disciples. And now is the only time that we have to do that. So let's get to work. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he give you peace. And all God's people say, Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.